good news, good news. Always good news, good news, good news. There is good news today. No matter what else is happening in the world. Always good news, good news. There is always good news today. Welcome to Good News Today, the program where you will always find good news, no matter what else is happening in the world. I'm Jim Dearman, your host for Good News Today. Thanks so much for joining us once again. Let me tell you what's coming up on today's program. Of course, we'll begin with our devotional time, which consists of our scripture reading, beautiful singing, and then a brief study of our scripture. And today we go to the Gospel according to Luke, and we're going to look at four deaths of a Christian. Four deaths of a Christian. You'll see what that's about as we look at Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through 26. And following our devotional time, another walking and talking through Proverbs with Freddie Clayton. And you will not want to miss that. And then it's Be Ready Always with David Smith as he deals with some questions uh, from viewers about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And we know you want to stay tuned for that. And then it's our GNT Q&A, our question and answer. And today's question, what is meant by the foolishness of God? What is meant by the foolishness of God? We'll go to 1 Corinthians and, and answer that question in our final segment. So that's what's coming your way, and we're so glad that you have come our way. We hope you have your Bibles open to Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through 26. Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words... Of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. back for the study portion of our devotional time, and we're looking at Luke chapter 9, uh, verses 23 through 26. I want to get some background before we look at these verses, which we said earlier reflect what we might call four deaths of a Christian in verses 23 through 26 of Luke 9. But for some background, go with me to, the, to John chapter 21, and we're going to look at verses 15 through 22. This is the very poignant exchange between uh, Jesus and Peter after the resurrection of Jesus, of course, and when Peter, who had, as you recall, denied the Lord three times, in this exchange he, he is called upon to uh, express his love for the Lord. 
three times. Uh, so when they had eaten breakfast, this is verse 15 of John 21, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Now verse 18, most assuredly, this is Jesus speaking to Peter now, most assuredly I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. Then verse 19 gives us an explanation. This he spoke signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved uh, following. This is uh, John who, uh, to whom he refers who also had leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who, uh, who is the one, uh, and the one who had said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? That's John, of course, identifying John. In verse 21, Peter seeing him, that is seeing John now, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Now, what we have learned here that is that Jesus explicitly tells Peter, Peter, you are going to die a martyr's death for me. You are going to die for me. And he said, knowing that, follow me. And Peter, knowing that he would die for the Lord, as we see subsequently from the record of Peter's life, indeed followed the Lord, even unto death. And so Peter, who had denied the Lord three times, confirmed his love for him three times here, and also lived out his life in faithfulness to the Lord and died a martyr's death. Tradition tells us that Peter was crucified head downward. Now that's a tradition. We don't know that for a certainty. But the idea of his being crucified head downward supposedly was at his request because he did not want to... Uh, didn't consider himself worthy to die in the same manner as did his Lord, being crucified upward, of course, on the cross. And so he, he uh, requested to be crucified head downward. Now, what this obviously reflects is complete dedication and devotion to the Lord. What is it that enabled Peter to, to live the remainder of his life knowing that he was going to die for the Lord. And near the end of his life, in one of his epistles, he expressed to those to whom he wrote that he knew it was going, about time, it was getting close, the very thing that, that the Lord had showed him at the time we just read in John 21 was, was nearing. It was coming, coming near. In other words, he never forgot it. He understood that he would die for the Lord. What enabled him to be dedicated enough to live his life faithfully knowing that he was going to die for the Lord. Let me suggest to you as we go back to Luke 9, 23 through 26, that there are four deaths that any follower of Christ must die if his ultimate physical death, the death that all of us will die unless the Lord comes first, that if that death is to glorify God, then we're going to have to die in four other ways. What are those ways? Well, the first one is seen in Luke 9, 23. Notice that verse again. Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. There's the first death, death to self. Let him deny himself. We must die to self. Notice Jesus did not say if anyone would be a follower of him, let him diminish himself. Let him put himself on the back burner, so to speak, and put me on the front burner. No, he said, deny himself. In other words, a complete self-sacrifice. And that's what the Lord uh, requires. When we go um, a, little, uh, a little farther in the book, a little farther in the book, we, uh, we see that in Luke chapter 14, 
uh, Jesus had something to say along these, along these uh, same lines. Listen to it. If anyone, this is Luke fourteen twenty six, if anyone comes to me and does not take uh, and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, in his own life also. He cannot be my disciple. Now, I think we've probably mentioned before in this text that the word hate doesn't mean hostility towards your parents or brothers or sisters, but the word hate means to love less. Anyone who comes after me and does not love less all other earthly relations, he cannot be my disciple. And so the first death that one must die in order to ultimately die his physical death and bring glory to God in that death is death to self. But the second death is death to security. Notice this, death to, death to security. That's verse 24. Look at that verse again. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. That's death to security. In other words, if we, if we were called upon by some uh, earthly authority, as many early Christians were, to deny the Lord or die on the spot, what would we do? Would we opt to have the security of living a little bit longer on this earth? Or would we die knowing that our death would glorify God? In other words, would we be willing to die to the security of this life? That's what's involved here. There's a passage in Matthew 10, 28 where Jesus says, and do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. But fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. In other words, fear the Lord. Give him the reverence and the respect, because he is the one that, that controls your eternal destiny. And so there were early Christians who were faced with the choice of either denying the Lord or dying and they went to their deaths with a song of praise on their lips because they knew that their eternal security was more important than their temporary security in this life. And so we must die to security. But then verse 25 tells us we must die to sin. Listen to verse 25. For what profit is it if a man to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? Now, what is it that destroys a man's soul or causes him to lose his soul? It's sin. And so we must die to sin. That is, we die to the practice of sin. When we become Christians, believing in Christ, acting upon that faith by repenting of our sins, confessing him to be the Christ, being buried with him in baptism for the remission of sins, as the Bible clearly teaches, raised to walk in newness of life, added to the kingdom, the church, then we must give up the practice of sin. Now, that doesn't mean that we will be perfect, sinlessly perfect. Only one person who's ever lived was sinlessly perfect, that was Christ. But what he is saying is, what the Bible teaches clearly, is that we must give up the practice of sin. John tells us that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses, keeps on cleansing us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, 1 John 1, verses 7 through 9. There's the process by which the Christian remains pure. It's by the cleansing power of the blood as he continues to walk in the light of God's word. He must be an obedient child. And when he falls short, as he inevitably will, despite his best efforts, then that blood keeps on cleansing. And the beautiful privilege of prayer enables us to go to God the Father for forgiveness, for strength, and for comfort and encouragement in living the Christian life. But we must die to the practice of sin. We can't live like we once did before becoming Christians. Then finally, and very quickly, the fourth death is in verse 26, and it's the death to shame. The death to shame. Jesus says, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. We must never be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, as Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1, verse 8, and admonished him never to be ashamed of the word of God. Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you, and yet with meekness and fear, as Peter admonished in 1 Peter 3, 15. So four deaths, death to self, security, sin, and shame, 
will allow us to successfully die that final death, a death that will glorify God if we die as faithful children of God. That's all the time we have for our devotional time, time to walk and talk through Proverbs once again with Freddie Clayton. The book of Proverbs is filled with the practical wisdom that will assist us today just as much as when written 3,000 years ago by inspiration of God through Solomon, the third king of Israel. Since heaven's wisdom has been made available to us, we must decide as to whether we will find the direction contained therein. Will you? Will I? He that hath ears to hear, let him hear Proverbs chapter 17 at verse 28. Even a fool is counted wise when he holds his peace. When he shuts his lips, he is considered perceptive. Let's think seriously about this proverb. On July the 20th, 2017, O.J. Simpson was granted parole by the State of Nevada Parole Board for his part in an armed robbery after serving nine years of a 30-year sentence. As I listened intently to his words before that board, I was puzzled by his comment. Later that day, one of his former defense attorneys for another incident in Los Angeles, a man by the name of Alan Dershowitz, commented that with what we saw and heard from O.J. during the parole hearing was evidence of the reason why he was not allowed by his lawyers to take the stand in his murder trial in L.A. Could this Jewish lawyer be using the principle of Proverbs chapter 17 at verse 28? I believe so because it certainly fits. When a person openly lies about well-known facts, it demonstrates a failure to heed the sage advice gleaned from this proverb. Boil down to Tennessee Hills vernacular, if you keep your mouth shut, at least nobody will know you're a fool due to the verbal self-exposure. While there may certainly be other ways for people to come to that conclusion, Biting your lip goes a long way in keeping the obvious less obvious. This could very well be the reason why it is uncommon for criminals to testify on their own behalf due to obvious self-incrimination. This does not imply that all criminals are intellectually bankrupt, but that how and what one says can be telling, more telling, than a fool desires. Of course, this is a difficult thing for the foolish person to do because they do not consider themselves to be foolish. Therefore, they run their mouths excessively, blathering folly for all to hear, and thus their secret is out. While others who do not know us may have doubts about us, by opening our mouths, we may remove all doubt, be it wise or foolish. This is Freddie Clayton walking and talking through Proverbs. Our thanks to Freddie Clayton for another excellent walking and talking through Proverbs segment. Coming up, it is uh, David Smith with Be Ready Always after we take a, a brief and very important information break. We'll be right back. You may have questions or comments about Good News Today. We'd like to hear from you. Or if you would like to receive free Bible study materials, please contact us. Our mailing address is Good News Today, P.O. Box 206, Dunlap, Tennessee 37327. That's Good News Today, P.O. Box 206, Dunlap, Tennessee 37327. You may prefer to email us at goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. That's goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. Or call us toll free at 1-877-384-7221. That's 1-877-384-7221. We'd like to hear from you. Hearing from our viewers is always good news to us. We want you to take advantage of that contact information and we want you to uh, download the free app. If you have a smart device, you can download the Good News Today app and watch the program in its entirety or segments of the program at your convenience. And we want you to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Right now, we want you to like, and we know you will, another excellent segment from David Smith. Here's Be Ready Always. 
The Bible tells us to be ready always to give an answer to every man that would ask us for the reason of the hope that is within us and to do it with meekness and with fear. 1 Peter 3 verse 15. Hi, I'm David Smith and this is Be Ready Always. You know, from time to time we address subjects in this segment and we get viewer response and sometimes certain subject matter is prone to more viewer response than others and perhaps none more so than issues of marriage, divorce, and remarriage. We can understand that when we deal with matters of marriage, divorce, and remarriage, we're, we're talking about very emotional issues where there are family ties and strong relationships that are connected. And, and so it, it can be, from the human perspective, a, a confusing subject. But God is, is very clear in those matters. From time to time, people will ask about a, a statement Paul makes in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. In verse 15 of that chapter, Paul says this, but if an unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases. But God has called us to peace. And we've received several questions from viewers where people ask this question, isn't, isn't Paul really saying that there's another reason for marriage, divorce, and remarriage, or divorce and remarriage besides what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 9, where there it says, except it be for fornication. Isn't Paul really saying that for an issue of a believer and an unbeliever being together, isn't, isn't that also a reason that a person could divorce a spouse and, and be married to another? Let, let's take a look again at this passage so that the next time it comes up, we can be ready to give an answer. Here's the first thing we want to do. We want to actually drop back a few verses to verse 11. If we have a pen or a pencil ready, let's do this in verse 11. Paul says, But even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be, and here's the phrase we want to underline, be reconciled to her husband. Especially notice that last part, to her husband. And then, of course, Paul reverses it and says at the end, and a husband is not to divorce his wife. In this passage, Paul is only considering a matter of separation, not real divorce for fornication, because here in this passage, even though there may be some separation between the two, Paul still says that that man and that woman are together because she can either remain by herself or she can be reconciled to her husband. She still has a husband. We'll also notice if we drop down to verse 15, really the verse in question, in the same context, Paul says if the unbeliever departs, then the brother or the sister, the Christian, is not under bondage in such cases. Now the kind of bondage that's under consideration here is like a slavery. And what Paul is saying is that if an unbeliever departs in some strenuous time because of the believer's faith, the believer is not in a type of slavery as such that would cause him or her to have to leave Jesus Christ to follow that spouse, to remain in that marriage. And that's what Paul is saying. He's not saying there's a reason for divorce. He's simply saying that we must remain faithful to Jesus Christ. Is this passage teaching another cause for divorce and remarriage? No. Paul's just simply addressing the issue of stressful times that may occur because of political or cultural conditions, especially because somebody may be faithful to the Lord and it causes some additional stress on the relationship because of the unbeliever, but it's not a cause for divorce and remarriage. Let's do this. Underneath or out beside verse 15 somewhere in our Bibles, let's write the verses 1 Peter 3 verses 1 through 5. Now there's a reason we do that. In those passages, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, here's, here's what Peter says. He says that if a person has an unbelieving spouse, rather than leave that person, we are supposed to try to convert that person by a godly lifestyle. So it would be in conflict with what Peter said, and it would be in conflict with what Jesus says was the only exception for divorce and remarriage in Matthew chapter 19, 9, if Paul is now saying there's another reason that somebody might be able to divorce and remarry. Paul is simply saying in 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 15 that we are not under the kind of bondage that would cause us to leave Jesus Christ to follow someone else. Instead, what we ought to try to do is be faithful and convert the unbelieving spouse. Hopefully this helps so that the next time it comes up in conversation, we will be ready to give an answer. 
I'm David Smith. This is Be Ready Always. Our thanks to David Smith. Coming up, it's our final segment. It's our GNT Q&A. What is meant by the foolishness of God? We'll answer that after another brief break. back for the final segment of our program, and that final segment is our GNT Q&A. We do want you to take advantage of the contact information again. Please uh, uh, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, download the uh, smart device app, the Good News Today app. Just go to your app, appropriate app store and search for Good News Today and download it. Watch the program at any time. And uh, also visit our website at gnttv.org gnttv.org. Uh, here's our question. We've mentioned it before. What is meant by the foolishness of God? Well, let's go to 1 Corinthians 1, 18, where Paul writes, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So when Paul refers to the foolishness of God, he's referring it to it, to it from the uh, perspective of those who don't really have any interest in spiritual things and do not see and understand and appreciate the, uh, the power of uh, the cross and the meaning of the cross and the importance and the power of preaching uh, of the gospel of Christ. Some things God commands also appear foolish to man, uh, and they question God's word. Uh, for example, baptism for the remission of sins is tragically uh, questioned by uh, so many people, and yet baptism for the remission of sins is clearly taught in Scripture. Of course, it must be preceded by faith that leads one to repent, to confess the name of Christ, and then to be buried in baptism for the remission of sins. So that's what's meant by the foolishness of God, not foolishness from God's perspective, but from man's. Thanks for being with us. Always good news, good news, good news, there is good news today. Good news, good news, the world. Always good news, good news, good news, there is good news today. All around the world, good news, always good news.